Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse DePlantis here. I hope you're enjoying our YouTube videos. That's why you don't want to miss anything. So like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you will know when new content has been posted. That's like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. So right now, watch this and be blessed. But God is so good and gracious. So if you've got your Bible, let's go to our um, main scripture of Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start out with part 2, title of what our message is, or this series is Time, Our Most Precious Commodity. Time, Our Most Precious Commodity. Now I'll go over a little bit what I said yesterday and then get into part 2. As I said yesterday, I, I travel quite extensively all over the world preaching the gospel usually anywhere from three to four or five times a week I'm preaching the gospel somewhere, somehow. But I'm thanking God that I'm starting to use some of my technology and uh, instead of running all over the world, I started doing some of these live chats. I've never done that before in my life, you know. People can see you and all that kind of stuff. And that was really wonderful. Jam the lines up, shut down the service, and all these people calling in from everywhere and you get to talk to them. And, and it was just truly a blessing. I thought, you know, I can use this and I won't have to go over there. But I've learned something that it's like a rock star. I don't care how good your album is, you got a tour. <laughs> you got a tour, you know, you just got to go out and do some touring and stuff like of that nature. But I've seen so many different things and I have so many ministers ask me, what's going on out there? Or what's God saying to you? But the most prevalent question is, what's going on out there? And by traveling in so many different denominational, non-denominational, interdenominational churches, convention centers, football stadiums, you know, all kinds of different things, you really see the, uh, what people are doing as well as what's happening in life. And Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, and I want to start reading again in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start reading with, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, let's read with verse... 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou, thou sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now verse 16 is what I want to deal with, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now that was wrote 2,000 years ago, so how much more evil they are today? And we really think about that, yet there's a great, great falling away. People are almost, they laugh at God, make fun of God. Uh, atheism has become very prevalent. I think Europe's about 60%, 70% atheism, and yet Christianity out of Europe came to America. It's amazing. And I, I always tell people there are no unbelievers after death. <laughs> uh, you get a revelation. <laughs> and some people say, I don't believe that. We'll shoot the dice. I wouldn't gamble with eternity because that's a long time. See, I had one person tell me, well, supposing God doesn't exist. I said, well, he said, then you've wasted your life. I said, no, I lived a good life. I lived a high moral life. I was a blessing to my family, to my friends. I was a blessing to God's work. And if I just die and that's it, I, I, I lived a good life. I said, but if there is a God, you're in trouble. <laughs> so shoot the dice. And I don't believe in gambling with eternity, or much less gambling with anything. Because if you understand anything about gambling, especially at any place, you can tell who's winning. If you go to Las Vegas, you can tell who's winning. Caesars is winning. You understand? The Win Hotel, they're winning. Look, at, you don't build multi-billion dollar hotels, multi-billion dollar hotels, and pay them off in two years with the slot machines. Why? Because grandma's doing this. So, and I realize that I don't gamble with nothing because game, gaming or gambling is a chance. I prefer a sure thing and the word of God. Let me just say this. You can trust the Bible. You can trust the Bible. Now, yesterday I started out with the pricelessness of time. I told you to write down that great opportunity must be prepared for, not simply waited for. And I told you there's so many people waiting for an opportunity to come. And when it comes, they don't know what to do with it. I've heard people say, boy, Lord, if you gave me a million dollars. And I've seen some people get a million dollars and lose it because they never, they never prepared for it. They were just excited that they got it. Like those uh, people that win the lotteries. It's amazing. If you do a study on all the people who won the lotteries, about 95% of them are in jail and broke. 
and went through all kinds of money. You see, they waited for that opportunity, kept buying that lottery ticket, whatever, and then all of a sudden when it came, they didn't prepare for it, so they didn't know what to do with it. I told you that opportunity does not come loudly, but it often comes suddenly and stealthily, taking you unawares. Because you've got to remember, when something has, you, you, you hear the old statement, strike when the iron's hot? Well, that's a true statement, because you see, they may not come back real quick, or they may never come back at all. So you must be ready in all that you set yourself to do. I told you yesterday the real difference between people is not in their chances, but in their ability to recognize their chances. You might check your notes on that when you were uh, writing those down. The real difference between people is not in their chances, but in their ability to recognize their chances. You see, the, the opportunities and the opportunity come by, and it's, and it's not really by chance in a sense. Now, what do you do with that? And I've told you that my wife says he's always got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, all kind, I have all kinds of plans. Because I realize that sometimes people, they really mean well to do something, but then it doesn't work out that way. So you got to go to phase two. Like if you only got one plan and you have a major emergency, you're in trouble. That's why in, on an airplane, and I have my own airplane, that we have a lot of what we call backup systems. If something fails, we go to another system. If that fails, we go to another system. Now, I, I, I have a Falcon, which was three, three, engine, three jet engines. In other words, if one fails, we're still okay. We're still flying. If another fails, we're still flying. The third one fails, we start praying real hard. <laughs> because I've learned something about that. Uh, where are you going? Down. We're going down. There ain't no other choice. <laughs> Gravity will make you come down. And uh, so, but there's a lot of what I call fail safe uh, uh, things that they have on an aircraft. It's, it's amazing how many things, if something goes wrong, they flip another switch, do something, we go to another backup battery, we go to another generator, we go to another different things. You must do that as, as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because see, there are a lot of failures out there, but a failure is not someone that falls in the mud, it's the one that lives in the mud. I think Jerry uses this scripture all the time, Micah 7, when I fall, I shall arise. I love that when I hear Jerry preach on that. And people think they, they fail because they fail. No, they fail because they stayed down. You see what I'm saying? So that's what I mean. The real difference between people is not in their chances, but in their ability to recognize their chances. Then I told you and closed out with this, opportunities of time lead to solemn issues of eternity. Opportunities of time lead to solemn issues of eternity because what I'm doing today is directing and guiding my life or what, when I go to the next life because it's the foundation of what I'm going to do. See, I love science and I, and, and I study science and I, Kathy can't get over how much I know about space. I love space. I love Star Trek, the final frontier. <laughs> you know, they say I'll ask at the final frontier. No, no, no. One time I went outside my house and I was just looking up there and, 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 and God gave me a project that's just unbelievable, totally impossible. That's why it's God, because that's what uh, uh, you were saying yesterday. And he says, you know, he said, i never forget, I just looked up in the sky and I said, Lord, are there other people out there? Are there other people? He said, well, I'm here. <laughs> he said, do I create dead planets? No, you don't create nothing. You couldn't even go to funerals. You mess them up. <laughs> that raised people from the dead, even though you paid for the funeral. Tried to get the money back on the flowers, but it didn't work. <laughs> he said, then what created deadness? What comes to kill? You see, this revolution that Satan did was more than just this planet. There are a lot of things out there. So I constantly study that stuff. I, I enjoyed it and I incorporated it in my life and in my study of the Word of God. Now, when I approach the Bible, I approach it all the time like this. What have I missed? You ought to write that down. And sometimes I think I know a scripture completely, fully. I think I got it all. You know, I said, I, mean, I can't squeeze another piece of anything out this verse. And then I look and say, but what have I missed? And all of a sudden, a revelation will come. What have I missed? Because this Bible, that's why you can trust it, is so packed with what you want to know scientifically as well as spiritually or naturally or morally. That's amazing to me. So when I, when I read a scripture, I go, what have I missed in this? And sometimes I've squeezed scriptures out. I mean, I thought, I, like, so you get blood out of a turnip. I thought there ain't nothing left. And all of a sudden, a totally, completely different direction. You see, uh, pops up and, oh, Lord, yes. So I understand that. So I realized, and I began to find things in the scripture that, 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 that the universe was actually was 
dramatically altered during this revolution between when Satan caused this fight. You see what I'm saying? It was altered. So you got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. It's so vast that it's beyond the human mind to contain. We have so many stars. We have more stars than we have grains of sand on the planet Earth. Now think about that. Let that sink for a second. Next time you go to the beach, that's just one beach. Think of every bit of dust, every bit of sand. We have more stars in the universe than we have grains of sand on the earth. Now, do you think we're the only people out here? Do you think God did all that deadness out there just to have one planet? Now, this is his favorite one. He calls it his footstool, the apple of his eye. So what are you going to do when eternity starts? That's what I said. Opportunities of time lead to solemn issues of eternity. Now I want to get into part two. First, I dealt with the priceliness of time. Now I want to deal with the waste of time. I don't like the word waste. I hate it with a passion because there is a lost. But the disciples thought when Jesus fed the 5,000 was waste, he called it fragments. 12 baskets of prosperity was sitting out there, but because somebody couldn't see it other than Jesus. Pick up the fragments that we have no, what's the word he used? Loss, if you read the King James. See, now to everybody else, that's waste. Yet, now, if, in the waste business of America is major money. I talked to a guy not too long ago, he owns a, I don't know, he probably got I don't know, maybe a hundred garbage trucks. I said, boy, I don't see how you can stand behind one of them garbage trucks. He said, I smell all the way to the bank. Yeah. Let me tell you something. You find something that nobody else wants to do and you do it, you're going to get rich. Yeah. That's why they call filthy rich. That's where you get that said, filthy rich. And you know, let me just make this announcement. I'm almost filthy. <laughs> Glory to God. Almost filthy, Lord Jesus. I just got to go stand behind some more garbage trucks, I guess. <laughs> I never thought of it in that sense. And he doesn't waste time, this man. Because he did something nobody else wants to do. Hmm. So let's deal with that this morning. Write this down. The waste of time is, is a criminal thing. Write that down. The waste of time is a criminal thing. It will always involve irreparable loss. I refuse to waste time in my ministry or in my private life or a social life. When I, in other words, when I have a friend come over to my house, like when Jerry and Carolyn come over, we were doing something. In fact, we, we're waiting on a championship game. <laughs> yeah, me and Jerry, we, I have a pool table in my house and uh, actually up in my uh, fun room, what they call, and uh, and uh, Jerry had to leave it. Uh, suddenly, him and Carolyn had to leave. Uh, something happened, and uh, we were about ready to play the championship game. You know, I won one, he lost one, uh, I lost one. You know, we, so, so he's got to come back, and we got to go to a restaurant. So we got to fulfill those uh, destinies to let Jerry know how good I really am playing pool. <laughs> no, no, I think he's better than I am. I saw that. <laughs> Raise the law. It was a blessing. It's a criminal thing. When you miss an opportunity to let your light shine. Think about that for a minute. Because somebody may be needing some light. And you have to be very conscious of what's around you at all times. Especially if you're a Christian and totally special if you're a minister of the gospel. Because I want to tell you something. If you mess up, somebody's going to see it. Remember that old sermon I preached called a fit, a carnality? Have you had one today? Because, boy, when you blow it, everybody in town seems to know it. Hmm. So the waste of time is a criminal thing. It will involve irreparable, or irreparable loss. So I refuse to waste time. I'm usually always early. I, I don't like being late. If we have wheels up at the plane at 10 o'clock, usually I'm at that airport. I'm ready to walk on that plane at 930. And they tell me, so, but Jesse, you're going to be early. I said, have you checked the headwinds? Uh, yeah, well, you know how it is. Most of the time when you check them, they're wrong. Like especially when we fly to Hawaii, we're going to preach the gospel. You're crossing that ocean. I mean, you know, and, and they check it. They got all it. They, oh, this is what it is out there. Then you get out there and it's, it's, it's 50 knots stronger. 
or whatever. And every person that owns a plane loves tailwinds because now you're saving money because it's pushing you and you get to get to Hawaii a little closer and a little quicker, faster. You see what I'm saying? And, uh, and me, to me, Hawaii is a workplace for me. I got I to gotta go there without just preaching my guts out. I just do it all the time. And that's what Kathy says. I've got the revelation, but you just don't seem to get it. And, and that's true. I mean, I, I'm very hard. Uh, I, I struggle with re relaxation. My, my dad's going to be 89 years old come this October. He said, you need to slow down. I said, Dad, you never taught me that. You taught me, what you taking the day off for, boy? Are you crazy? <laughs> and you know, and when it gets into you, that's not an easy thing to break. So what I'm saying here, uh, the waste of time is a criminal thing. It will always involve irreparable loss. Jesus said, redeem the time because the days are evil. Now write this down. The need of doing is pressing because the time of doing is short. The need of doing is pressing because the time of doing is short. I've had some people say, Brother Jesse, the Lord told me to give you something, but what are you waiting? Why are you telling me? Just put it in a plate. I mean, how many ministers know that? You know, the Lord told me to do this. Well, when? And I don't mean, I'm not trying to get it because I didn't ask you for it. That's not the issue. But see, you don't realize if you're a minister that the things that God wants us to do. Why are projects delayed? Because people have not obeyed, including the ministry at times. Just think about that. If everybody sent me a dollar that's on my mailing list, oh, Jesus, it's amazing what I could do. I could go to every country in the world, preach this gospel, and leave offerings by the basketfuls. I don't mean that pridefully, because there's so much in the Bible said, be ye therefore a doer of the word, not a hearer, only deceiving yourself. There's so many things. God's always got a project for me. Always. I had a lady call me from Australia. She said, Brother Jesse, I said, how you doing? Yeah, she said, listen, I want the message that I got saved, uh, uh, that I heard you preach. I said, well, what is that? She said, well, you preached it in 1978. <laughs> 1978, that's when I started. Yeah, I heard it and I got born again. I want my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren to hear the sermon that got me born again. Now watch this. I had no concept of any of this. I thought, do we have that? <laughs> well, we have something called the archives. I, you know, I call it the vault. And we went in and found that message. But when we went to put it on this high tech equipment, it started breaking up. We stop. And then I thought of I Love Lucy, Johnny Carson, Hollywood movies are trying to restore these films because they're on celluloid and breaking up. Now we have the technology to preserve something for life. And the Lord said, Project Legacy. Project Legacy. And when I heard, I said, let me hear myself preaching 34 years ago. Man, I talk fast. I still talk fast, but I'm, I really talk fast. And I thought, listen to this. And I enjoyed myself. And all of a sudden, I began to revert back. And you see, if the Lord wouldn't have given someone some invention to preserve these things. Think if we lost everything brother and sister Copeland ever said. That would be a tragedy. Like Jerry's got those real to real tapes. But one day, if you put that around a socket, see that's a magnetic tape. You put that around a socket, it's going to suck his voice off the tape. Magnet, it's because electricity is going to pull it. But now they got the technology, they stop all that. See, that would be irreparable loss, wouldn't it? It would be a criminal thing not to hear six steps to excellence of ministry by Kenneth Copeland. The laws of prosperity. Before he wrote the book, when he was preaching it, think about that. So the Lord said, see, that was a project that I didn't, never even considered. So we have that going on in our ministry right now. A project. And I thought, my Lord, I would have never thought of that in a, in a hundred years. But someone did. You see what I'm saying? So the need of doing is pressing because the time of doing is short. So I keep thinking last night, people that walked forward gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, well, we started time right there. Did you know time started for people last night? You got born again right there. Everything from that point was washed away. 
Now you think about that. See, you just thought that, well, they just came up and gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. No, 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 you got to understand. There were some people in that line that was probably in their 50s. All right? Wipe it off. Gone. Doesn't exist. They are now 50-year-old babies. They're starting now. They started last. They're not even 24 hours old. And if they happen to bring up something they did yesterday morning, the Lord said, what? Because it's been erased completely. God is the only person in the world that can erase everything. Technology today, you think you erase something. You're living in a dream world. They can find it. But when God erases it, he erases not only from a natural man, he erases it from his own mind. You know, the Lord didn't know I used to be a drunk. Till just now. <laughs> now, I'm not going to get into the details, but he has no concept of that at all. Zero. Think about that. So there's so much pressing going on. I press the word the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, so I don't believe in wasting time. It's the same thing when you go to a mall. Why do you waste so much time looking? You're not going to look, you're going to buy. No, no, you don't understand. We want to see everything. You look at, women look at clothes that they don't even wear. They look at sizes that they can't get their leg in. <laughs> I don't mean that to be rude, but that's okay. I don't care. I go to a mall, don't take me long. Boom, I walk in there. Now when I go to the mall with Jerry, I feel like I'm with Kathy. I got to follow Jerry. I mean, but Jerry, Jerry, Jerry just short, boy. He got to, it's amazing. And it's amazing how we have a lot of the same taste. I mean, sometimes we'll zero in on one a sport coat or a suit. Boom. You know what I'm saying? And I, but I mean, now Jerry, he going to shop. He going to shop, son. Sometimes I want to go sit down on the bench and just wait for Jerry. <laughs> got a bench on that, Jerry. But he finds it. And that's great. I like that. <laughs> See, the need of doing is pressing on Jerry because the time of doing is short. <laughs> Which brings me to my next point. <laughs> Grasp life's prizes or you will end up in frustration and contempt. See, when you're wasting time, you're missing the prizes of life. Oh, there's no prize. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are prizes. There are trophies to be had. Let me say it again. Grasp life's prizes or you will end up in frustration and contempt. I've seen so many people. I can't seem to get ahead of life. You know why? You never went for the prize. You never went for it. You thought it was too complicated or too hard. That's a failure. If you run the race, I don't, the time factor has nothing to do with it. Remember Oprah Winfrey wanted to run a marathon? Now, but my marathon, I, I, I used to jog a lot until I blew my knee out jogging, of all places, in Hawaii, through ego. I was 39 years old, and I won in my classification, that big Hawaii thing they do, and I was running up Diamond Head. Now when you run up, we're not used to mountains in Louisiana. <laughs> and we don't have mountains, but we've got mosquitoes as big as eagles. You understand what I'm saying? We got mosquitoes, son. My grandbaby calls it posquitos. Them posquitos are bad. I'm running and a 72 year old man passed me up. <laughs> I'm 39, he said, come on young man, you can make it. I said, I'm gonna kill that sucker. I, took, I like to kill myself. Now he won in his class, 72. Actually, it was 70 to 75. And I won in mine, 39 to 44. I'll never forget that. I thought I was gonna die. I said, Jesus, he said, you're on your own, son. Quit following the 72 year old man. And when, but when we turned around, that's what I didn't know. 
When we turned around, I didn't know how to run down a mountain. I knew how to run up one. Now gravity's pushing you. And within 30 seconds, I, all my wind was back. I thought, this is wonderful, but I'm slamming now. Bam! I should have been heel to it. But I was putting that pressure on that knee. Then I had to pray for God to heal that thing and fix it and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I mean, it took some, oh Lord, some, I mean, I mean, that knee swole up three times the size. But you know, when you're running, after a while, you got that adrenaline running so hard, you don't feel that pain. You don't realize that you hurt. Joe Namath, literally, I mean, some of his best football player was when he was hurt. But in those days, you didn't have what we have today until he finally went to the New York Jets and the guy looked at his knee and said, we got to fix this. When? Tomorrow. And if you know the story, you'll find out they're taking pictures of him in, in, in the hospital and he's in terrific pain because they fixed his knee. They want to put on a jersey so we can take it. People don't care, see, if money's involved in something. But they had made up their mind, we got to win. So that was the pressing of doing, see. Let me say it again. I want you to write that down so you can get that. The pressing, the need of doing is pressing because the time of doing is short. Write this down. Your destiny is not firm. Your free will has been given to you to make choices. Now, destiny happens one day at a time. Remember that song? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's true. Let me say it again. Your destiny is not firm. Your free will has been given to you to make choices. Destiny happens one day at a time. That's what I mean. So I'm always out. I, I got to complete my destiny and reach my destination. Why? Because I refuse to waste time. Some of you have been having a dream, but you keep dreaming. You just keep dreaming. You don't, keep, you don't start doing. Write this down. This will help you. Wandering around in daydreams never lets you believe what it takes so you can change what it takes to start doing what it takes. Let me say it again. Wandering around in daydreams never lets you believe what it takes so you can change what it takes to start doing what it takes. Now, I like daydreaming, but my God, you're going to have to put some action behind it. You don't have to put some action behind it. See, when I sow a seed, what is financial, I put some action behind it. I, I, I put God in remembrance of his word. I said, you know, I was persecuted yesterday for your sake. So where's my hundredfold? Now, some of y'all missed that. Excuse me, Jesus. Excuse me. Jesus, come here. I was persecuted for your sake. Did you see those helicopters flying over my house? Did you see me on the news? I was persecuted. They were saying things that were totally wrong, that were not true about me. Where my hundredfold? Think about that for a minute. Bible said 36 and hundredfold with persecution. Well, I've had the persecution. How come I don't have the hundredfold? So now when I get the hundredfold, I don't care how much you persecute. <laughs> persecute all you want. You see my point? It's a waste of time. I said, Lord, where's my hundredfold? And little did I realize it, it was in my fragments and didn't even know it. Because I thought it didn't mean much. Then I turned around, good, don't think of that. And God blessed it. So you grasp life's prizes or you will end up in frustration and contempt. I've seen so many people frustrated. I tried that and it didn't work. I tried it and it did work. Here she comes again. So I just let her run by. There you go, sweetheart. Hallelujah. Boy, that ponytail is just a flipping, isn't it? Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, when it hits you, you just got to go. You know what I'm saying? You grasp that. She grasps something. I don't know what it is, but whatever she's drinking, I want some of that. <laughs> you grasp life's prices. When I decided to marry Kathy, I was not interested in marrying Kathy. I liked her a lot. She was fun to be with, blah, blah. You know, I, I liked the date. She was real. I, I, but I, went, I, I was afraid of marriage. What do you mean? Why was I afraid of marriage? Because I seen some unhappy marriages. But I thought, and I got to thinking, why am I judging something that might, may never happen? So one time I went up to, I was engaged. I said, listen, we got to back this thing down. I, I didn't want to tell I was afraid. Cause you know, I'm a man. She said, it's either now or never, sucker. <laughs> it's now or never. Now I said, now I got to make, if I want this prize, I might do something. 
So I said, forget what I said. She said, I already did. <laughs> I don't know why things are always funny with me. We were married at Holy Rosary Catholic Church. Walked in that church, and nomine patria fili, spiritu santi. He said, do you take this woman? I said, that's what I've been trying to do for several years. <laughs> yes, yes. You ain't got to say nothing else. You got my attention right there. <laughs> that priest was a funny man. I was such a sinner. He caught me drinking the holy wine. <laughs> well, he had sit, sit me in the back. This is a true story. Sit me in the back, you know. Well, I got to come out, and I saw the wine. You know, and the, you know, this is what they do to communion. I said, I've been wanting to taste that all my life. <laughs> Only the priest can drink the wine. So I cracked one of them bottles open. <laughs> He goes, no, that's blessed. I said, it sure is. That's a true story. I should not have done that. <laughs> Are you sure you're going to raise your children to Catholic? Give me a case of that wine and we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that's sad, isn't it? That's sad. But when he said, by the power vested in me by God Almighty in the state of Louisiana, and I pronounce you man and wife. Now, in those days, you couldn't kiss you. No, no, they do it now. You don't kiss your wife in the church. Uh-uh. No, not Louisiana. No, no, man. I mean, that's too holy. You're on the altar here. Remember that, Kathy? So we just turned around, walked out, and I was thinking, boy, I'm getting these lips ready, son. I'm going to double lock lip this woman's hand in a second. And when we walked out that door, That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> this media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.